starts with Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 to 6. As you know, that is in the thick of that Sinai covenant. God entering into a relationship with his people. And God says that if you obey me fully and keep these commandments, then I will be your God and you will be my people. So formerly, at the foot of Mount Sinai, Israelites are becoming God's people. And as they become God's people, they become actually, this is nation in the making. And for nation to, to be in place, you need three things, right? The sovereignty, uh, in other words, who is going to rule this, and also people, and also land. Now in Exodus chapter 19, uh, some two million people who are coming out of uh, Egypt are about to be formed as a nation. They have two million body masses, and they have the land in Canaan they're about to take. And also, in chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Ten Commandments and other laws that will then uh, uh, form a constitution, right? So here is the nation in the making. Now, that passage, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, was first applied to the people of Israelites, but they did not obey God's command. They, in fact, forfeited that privileged position of being the people of God. And so what happens as we come to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9? Now it's the church, God's people. The church is, the, is God's people, and they are now given uh, identity as well as mission. And that's what we're going to look at uh, shortly. Now let's then, uh, I'm going to go back and forth between my PowerPoint and the handouts. Now, I come from Toronto, and at this point, I am very happy because my basketball team is doing very, very well. And anybody following the Toronto Raptors? Uh, they have won two games uh, in the first round of uh, playoff, so I'm very happy. Uh, you know, Toronto is a fascinating city, a city of six million people, and of that, more than three million people do not speak English as their mother tongue. In other words, more than three million of them are somebody like me, people like me. Now, I speak Korean much better than I speak English because Korean is my mother tongue. Now imagine a city filled with people who speak another language far better than English because they are first generation immigrants, right? And that means it's a city with full of opportunities. It, it would be almost a crime to stay within your own ethnic enclave and never think about people outside your own. It would be a sin almost. So that's the setting that I'm coming from and that's the setting in which I'm trying to motivate my people to look beyond the church walls. Now as uh, is the case with most immigrant churches, when we first came, uh, some 40, 50 years ago, we were renting a facility from a Canadian church. But we soon outgrew, and uh, we uh, are now uh, uh, in a place of our own. Sometimes I get this question, uh, I, get, uh, I get asked a lot with this question. People, immigrants will, immigrants will come uh, to a new place like Toronto, and they will ask, uh, where is a good church around here? They will ask, because I want to go to a good church. Now let me ask you, and now I'll give you about 20 seconds so you can share your answer to somebody next to you. What would you say are some of the criteria that you would use to determine whether the church is good or not? Okay, so let's take 10 seconds each and turn to your neighbor and ask, okay, what makes a church a good church? All right, let's turn the conversation around. Okay. Let me, let me give you some people who are into church growth model will say church is a good church if it has three B's. 
Okay. So what are those three Bs? Building, budget, <laughs> baptism. Yeah. So if you have three Bs going in your church, for example, you got a nice church building, so you don't have to worry about where are we going to meet this, this week and next week and the week after. And also, budget-wise, you're pretty strong, you're pretty stable. You don't have to worry about church not being able to do things because it doesn't have money. And also baptism. If you have newcomers and they are getting baptized and therefore your church is growing, then you say, well, our church must be good. I found out that those immigrant, Korean immigrants that I work with, they couldn't care less about these three Bs. That's not their criteria. These were the answers I was given. Number one, they really cared about inspiring worship. They would always ask, how good is the preacher? And how good is the praise team? How good is the music? Because they want to, oh, if you want to take a picture, you might want to wait until I get all the three points. <laughs> Uh, they were they're always asking, is his sermon good? Does he engage? Uh, uh, do we walk away with something, uh, a feeling that we've learned something, that we can apply it in our lives, right? Uh, so good worship, inspiring worship is very, very important. Second, great fellowship. When you go into this church, do people say hello to you? And do they ask you for, st please stay behind and let's talk. I want to know who you are, where you come from and, and how we can help you. Do they really try to get into your lives? Now, if you go to a church and nobody asks who you are first time, you are a little patient, so you go, okay, I'm going to try one more week. Next week you go, nobody asks you who you are. And you say, well, I believe in triune God, so I will go one more time. And the third time you go, and nobody is still, nobody couldn't care less whether you came or you did not come. Now, nobody wants a church like that, right? So that's important. The third point I found out, at least for the immigrants, uh, they wanted to see a strong Sunday school so that they can leave their kids in the Sunday school knowing that they're in good hands, that their kids will grow in their faith. Now, I think that by this uh, standard, um, I think Youngnak Church, the church that I, I, I'm serving, would be a, a pretty good church. But let's just go back to that passage, 1 Peter 2.9, and let's look at what the Bible says about what a good church is. Okay, here in this passage, we are given the identity and mission of the church. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, uh, like I said before, this is the uh, continuation from Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6, right? So now in 1 Peter 2, 9, the church is given this new description that it is the people of God. Now, the first half of the verse is the identity, fourfold identity of the church. The second half is the mission of the church. It says here that you may declare the praises of him. Oh, so our, the reason why the church exists is to declare God's praise. And when you declare God's praise inside the church, we call it worship. And when you de declare it outside the church, we call it mission. And you know, some of you may have read the book by John Piper, Let the Nations Be Glad. In that book, in the first few pages, the author asks, why does mission exist? And he answers, mission exists because worship does not. In other words, the goal of mission is to ensure that there is worship where there is no worship. So mission results in worship, and then worship now then in turn results in mission, and mission then worship. So it's like perpetual process of mission, worship, worship, mission, mission, worship, worship, mission, like that. That would be a sign of a healthy church that understands its identity and mission. But let's be totally honest and ask ourselves this question. How many churches really, and 
How many churches whose members truly understand its identity and its mission to be 1 Peter 2.9? In my opinion, there are three kinds of churches today. First is disobedient church, and that is on its way of dying. Second church, prosperous. Prosperous, meaning it is growing in number, but it's very consumer-oriented. In other words, it's meeting its own needs. And third kind is missional or purposeful and kingdom-minded. In other words, to really do what God has asked the church to do in 1 Peter 2.9. So, you know, uh, let us not kid ourselves. If a church is growing, church is growing, it does not mean necessarily it is missional. You can have a church that's growing in, into a mega church. You can have a church that's the size of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, et cetera, et cetera. But it can be just as selfish and egotistical as some of the churches that are dying. Okay. So, I'm not interested in the first two, but I am interested in the third, missional church. So, I have a big question. How do we go from a church that is otherwise a good church? People want to attend this church. There is there's inspiring worship. There is very warm fellowship going on. The Sunday school is very strong. And if I belong to this church, I think I'm going to be very happy. And I can see bringing all my friends to join this church. And next thing you know is that uh, next year we're going to have to build a bigger church. And on and on and on. But I don't think that's what God has in mind. Now, I'm going to skip a couple of uh, frames now. I'm, I'm going to come back to this. But I, let me ask you this question. One, one, da, one, ta, one day, I was having a meeting with my uh, past, uh, 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 pastoral staff, and I just threw out this question. Would anybody care if, for whatever reason, Yongnak Church no longer existed? Okay. Now, to put it another way, uh, you can just put, instead of Yongnak, your church. Okay. Now, for whatever, whatever reason, your church announces that as of next week, your church will no longer exist. Okay? For whatever reason, your church is going to no longer exist. My question is this. Who is going to be devastated the most at hearing the news that your church will no longer be around? Who is going to be saddened the most is my question. Okay? I asked this question to my, my pastor, pastoral staff, and one of them half-jokingly said, uh, our church, right beside our church, there's coffee shop and there's gas station. And the owner has been making a lot of money from our church. And they said, well, the owner of uh, Esso gas station and the Tim Hortons coffee shop, I think they're, they're going to be very, very sad. <laughs> Which is true, because we have a lot of people going there and buying coffee and they never give me any free coffee. <laughs> I think that's a very bad business practice. I said, yeah, but let's, um, no, let's take it a little more seriously. Like, who is going to be devastated because they heard that our church no longer is going to exist? And then another pastor said, well, I think our members will be very de devastated. No, no, we're not counting our members. Let's not talk about our members. Other than our members and other than the vendors around us, who are going to be sad, most sad, because our church no longer exists? Oh, our pastors were beginning to get the picture. Oh, that's right. I get it. See, our church, for example, is running in an orphanage in Cambodia. And if Yangnak no longer exists, then this orphanage has to close down. And some 50 kids have to go back to the street. Sorry, guys. Sorry, girls. We cannot feed you. We cannot take you to schools anymore because the church that has been sponsoring you for whatever reason decided not to be around. Sorry. People were beginning to get the picture. You know, um, 
let's, let's go back to the handout. I think what is so crucial is this, the third point, developing a conviction that the church exists for mission and not vice versa. Emil Brunner, a theologian, said, as fire exists by burning, church exists, exists by mission. You know, when you think about campfire, when you go on a camping trip, there's campfire, right? You try very hard, some of the, uh, the, the pieces of wood that you bring are wet, and therefore it's very hard to get going. So you do anything you, you can to get it going, and once it gets going, there's fire, then you say, yeah, it's on, there's fire. But when it quickly turns into smoke, then it, it is no longer fire. So, fire exists by burning. In the same way, church exists by mission. Okay? Now, if church, for whatever reason, does not engage in mission, well, church is very busy, no room for mission. And we ask, why are you so busy? Because we have worship service because we have to run Sunday school, because we have to provide merienda for fellowship, and, and all our resources are really expended to take care of the needs inside the church. And therefore, we have no energy, no resources left to do anything outside the church walls. Then, Emil Bruno will say, I, I wonder if we can call that a church. As much as you cannot call a fire a fire when it has no fire, when it has no a burning action. Let's look at Christopher Wright. By the way, if you're interested in a book that will really give you good footing, I encourage you to read by Christopher Wright a couple of books, Mission of God and also Mission of the People of God. Okay? Mission of God talks about what is God's, God's mission. And the mission of people of God is what should be our response. Those are very, very uh, good books. Uh, anyway, in the second book, he has this, this to say. Church is for mission and not mission for church. Did he understand what this means? In other words, God created church so that it will do mission. In other words, in order to do mission, God created church. Mission is the end. Church is means. But a lot of people think that, well, we have a church and uh, what shall we do? Well, let's do a little bit of mission. It's as though mission exists for church and we got it all wrong, is what Christoph Wright is saying. William Temple, one of my favorite uh, uh, persons that I quote from, who was uh, formerly the, Canter the Archbishop of Canterbury, Church is the only club in the world which exists for the sole purpose of benefiting its non-members. Think about that. Does your church operate under this kind of conviction? Or is your church uh, more like, we are here to protect our members. Only the members get to park here. Only the members get to come inside and eat merienda with us. Hey, did you sign the membership form? You didn't? Sorry, this merienda is not for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When we go to camp, members pay 100. Non-members pay 200. You see what I mean? We got, it, we got it backwards. That's what William Temple will say. So, uh, let's look at the next one. Church growth is not the kingdom growth. A lot of people are confused, confused that if we grow the church, then we are growing the kingdom of God. No. Growing the church is not tantamount to growing the kingdom. And a lot of people, you know, when they come out of uh, seminary, uh, thinking that someday I will become a pastor of a mega church, like the pastor that we both know, Pastor Ferdi and I, we know who we're talking about. Uh, this brother, his goal was to one day become a pastor of a mega church. Well, I don't think that's a noble goal, you know. And I don't, I don't think God wants us to to, to grow our church to be a mega church. Whatever we, we are doing and by, by product, if the church becomes big, so be it. But just getting your church big cannot be an end in itself, cannot be a goal in itself. We need to ask, if 
our church grows to be very big, we have to ask God, why, Lord, do you want our church to be big? It's very hard to maintain a big church, right? But Lord, why? There must be a reason, and we need to find purpose for it. So uh, the last item, church needs to be unselfish and think about people outside the church walls. Then it can truly be a sent community in the world. So for a pastor to be a missional, it begins with a very strong understanding of what church is. If you want your church to be missional, then you really need to understand what the Bible says about the church. Now, if I had more time, I would go through all the Bible passages to talk about four important characteristics of a church as the Bible teaches. But uh, I don't have that time, so I'm going to just skip. But please, um, uh, I refer to uh, this creed uh, in uh, church history. Uh, 381 AD, to be precise. Uh, as you know, the Nicene Creed was, uh, was uh, written up in 324 AD. Now, Nicene and Constantinopolis police, uh, Creed is, is really the, the revised and expanded version of the Nicene Creed. And so in, by 381, among other things, uh, it was able to define what church is. And I really like that. Uh, it says, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Here we have four important characteristics or attributes of the church. Okay. What are they? First, one, unity, unity of the church. The church has to be one. And so in the Bible, we have a lot of imageries, uh, like the body. You are the body, and you have body with many parts, and Christ is the head of the body, like that. So unity. The most important thing we need to seek in our churches is unity. Right? If the church is divided, it cannot do anything. So I believe in one, unity. I believe in holy. In other words, the church has to be holy. Holiness or purity is another important attribute of the church. Uh, when we say holy, it, we, we're talking about doctrinal holiness, doctrinal purity, as well as moral purity. So the church has to be uh, doctrinally holy. In, in other words, uh, in, in its Christology and in, in its uh, triune theology, uh, Trinitarian theology, uh, we, we, we ought to be like right on as the church fathers have taught us. Okay? So doctrinal purity and also moral purity. I know that there are a lot of issues in the world people are struggling with. And God's people are part of that fallen humanity and therefore we are going to struggle with similar issues. However, however, we as people who are in the process of being sanctified, we ought to sin less than people who are outside the church. Uh, we don't claim to be sinless, but we should sin less. Okay? Did you get that or did you not get that? It's not that difficult, is it? Yeah. yeah. Not sinless, but sinless. Right. Now, the third attribute is Catholicity now it has nothing to do with, with the word Roman Catholic Church, okay? It just means, Catholic just means uh, universal, universal. I believe in church universal. So what that means is that I believe in church uh, as long as the people in that church confess Jesus to be the Son of God and Jesus to be the Lord and Savior, then this church is no different from my church where we do not worship in the same style of music or uh, uh, don't even have the same language, uh, you know, don't eat, eat the same food and so on, or even uh, age-wise we're very different, another generation and so on. Well, church universal means then that uh, across age, culture, uh, whatever, uh, as long as you confess Jesus to be the Lord then we find each other as church, church universal. So I believe in one holy, 
Catholic. Now, so far, okay, but the last one, the fourth one, is where a lot of people either neglect or misinterpret. <laughs>